Good evening and welcome. My name is Vince Furpo. I am the Vice President for Public Engagement here at the Newberry Library. And I would like to start this evening by thanking all of you for being here for tonight's program. I promise it will be riveting. I'm very excited to hear this talk. Whether you are joining us here in the room or joining us via live stream, we are very grateful for your participation with the Newberry. If you are here in the room with us tonight, I do just want to take a second to remind you to put your cell phones or other electronic devices in silent mode, please. And I trust that a few of you, at least, are new to the Newberry. So I'd like to just take a moment to tell you a bit about how you can continue to engage with us after tonight's talk. Since our founding all the way back in 1887, the Newberry has inspired learning in the humanities. Our collection, which, yes, does include items on polar exploration, is your collection. You can freely explore over 600 years of human history in our reading rooms free of charge. And if you are unable to make it to Chicago, we have a wide array of collections and digital tools available on our website. We offer adult education classes and free exhibitions and programs just like this one to help all of us deepen our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. I hope tonight is just the beginning of you exploring your curiosity at the Newberry. And perhaps that starts with an exhibition. Our galleries will be open tonight after the talk until 7.30, so you are welcome to stop by and explore what we have to show. We have two exhibitions on display. The first is Seeing Race Before Race, which examines the roots of race from the Middle Ages to the 1800s, and Wheels, which illustrates what you might find in our collection when searching something as simple as wheels. Programs like tonight are supported through the generosity of our amazing community of donors. I hope you will consider making a gift to support the Newberry so that we can continue to provide these programs and exhibitions free of charge. If you're interested in making a gift, you can visit our website. The book that you've all come tonight to hear about is for sale in our bookshop, which is just off the lobby, and Men's Inbound will be available to sign copies after the talk. If you're joining via the live stream, don't forget to buy your copy on our Newberry Bookshop website. If you have questions for the speakers tonight, we do ask that you text them to the number you see on the screen, 833-899-3399. This is both for those of you in the room and those on the live stream. The number will continue to be displayed throughout the talk so you don't forget it. And now I'd like to just take a quick moment to introduce our two speakers. Maritime archaeologist Menson Bound served as the Triton Fellow in Maritime Archaeology at St. Peter's College, University of Oxford from 1992 to 2013. He was the Director of Exploration for both the 2019 and 2022 expeditions to locate the Endurance. Joining him tonight in conversation is Timothy Jacob, the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Endurance 2022 Expedition. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Menson and Timothy. All right. All right. Everybody We're here right. is okay? Yeah. Hey, and Vince, yeah. thanks for uh, those kind words, but also for uh, you know, the generous, generosity and help of your staff, uh, Alicia and Karen, they've been fantastic. And the exhibition you put on for my wife and I yesterday, thank you. Yeah, all right. Yeah, let's well. get into it. Yeah, yeah go. we don't have much time. <laughs> we haven't. Um, well. We are today, of course, here to talk about your book and about a great expedition, two great expeditions that you talk about uh, in equal parts in this book. But I want to start with where your path with Shackleton began, because it goes way back. Your relationship yeah. with Shackleton, bring, bring us back to the beginning. Yeah, um, sh I come from the Falkland Islands, uh, two little dots off the continental tip of South America, you know where I mean. Uh, and um, Shackleton was in the Falklands three times. And on the last occasion, he stayed with my family. We had a, 
uh, a rather disreputable bar and bedding establishment on the waterfront in Port Stanley. And when Shackleton fell out with the governor, he came and stayed with my family. And you know what? We still have the visitor's book in the family, and it's got Shackleton's signature in it, along with Wilsey and Cream. And, you know, Scott was never in the Falkland, so all Falkland Islanders were kind of weaned on the story of, of, of Shackleton. I have pictures of Shackleton in my house. And then when I was about 11 years old, I was given a, a book at uh, Sunday school for attendance. It was about Shackleton. I actually read it. So, yeah, I've kind of, uh, this whole thing has, has kind of been, a bit, you might say I became a bit obsessed with Shackleton, a bit like sort of, um, you know, Dante and his Beatrice or, or Ahab and the White Whale or Gollum and his precious, you know. It was, it was getting bad. Yeah. Um, started early, went on to a very prestigious full career in maritime archaeology that we don't have six hours to go into all of your incredible finds, um, but that's a whole other story. But amazingly, at a certain point, you got a chance to go and find endurance. Tell us a little bit about um, yeah. how, how the idea happened. came to be. Yeah, I, I know. I've seen it written and I've heard it said that it was my idea. It wasn't. Absolutely not. But I was there with the guy who conceived the whole thing. It was just him and me together. It was uh, August of 2012. This whole project, I mean, it was 10 years in the making. It didn't, as people think sometimes, sort of happen fully formed like, like Athena from the head of Zeus. No, we, uh, we had to work on this one. And um, I'd been asked by the Natural History Museum in South Ken in London if uh, I could find Scott's Terra Nova. That was the ship which took Scott on his voyage of no return to Antarctica in, what was it, uh, 1911, wasn't it? And uh, we all know the story. Norwegians got there first, and Scott and his party died on the way back. And as it happened, I actually had a really good set of coordinates for the, for the uh, uh, Terra Nova. And I said, you know, give me six days, give me the right kit, kit, and I will find that ship for you, the Terra Nova. So I'm in uh, a Cafe Nero in, uh, on the old Brompton Road in South Kensington uh, with my friend who, he's, I'm not allowed to give you his name because he like, he's very shy, but he's, he's absolutely fanatical about the sea and anything to do with ships and you know, all that kind of thing, an amazing guy. And we're there together talking about ships and I was really anxious to work out something we could do on the Terra Nova. He's holding the table. I'm over at the bar getting the coffees. And as I'm waiting for them to pour, I'm leafing through that day's copy of the Times. And Tim, this is true. On page seven, there's an article headlined, Terra Nova found. <laughs> yeah. I was totally devastated. So I went over to my friend, and he goes, he could see something was wrong. He goes, what, what's wrong, Vincent? And so I showed him the article. And he looked at it, and he scratched his head, and he tugged at his chin. And then he said, well, what about the endurance? And that was the moment of inception. And it grew from there. And the grand irony of all this, I tried to talk him out of it. I said, you know, hey, come on, you know, the, uh, it's very, very deep. It's on the perennial ice of the Weddell Sea. The technology is not ready for this one. But then he said, so this incredible company determined to find the endurance. He put together all these AUVs, um, autonomous underwater vehicles. And uh, what was it, uh, two years or something after that, Joe, uh, he and his wife and my, myself and my wonderful wife was here this evening. We were having dinner with him in the Cotswolds. And in the course of that meal, he said, the time is right to begin the search. We're ready to go. And he tasked me with finding the wreck. And a guy called uh, John Kingsford, an old friend of mine who runs this great company called DOS, uh, I, I, he, with, he had to put together all the hardware, find the ships and things like that, which wasn't easy. I disappeared into the archives and spent a couple of years researching and things. And you know the rest of the story. We got there in the end. Yeah, and you got two tries yeah. at it. And in your book, you spend the first half of the book talking about the 2019 Weddell Sea Expedition, yeah. and the second half talking about the Endurance 22 Expedition, which we'll spend most of our time on today. But in just a few minutes, what do we need to know about the Weddell Sea Expedition of 2019 to understand yeah. the Endurance 22 Expedition of 2022? Yeah. Right, uh, I mean... <laughs> 2019, it wasn't my finest moment at all. I'm an AUV guy, and it was an AUV expedition. AUVs are like uh, long torpedo-shaped things. But they have in them an incredible array of uh, remote sensing um, 
uh, what would you call them, devices, um, side scan sonar, sub bottom profiles, magnetometers, that kind of stuff. Uh, amazing kit, but probably not best suited for under the ice. And uh, we had a battle right from the start. We had an ROV, which we're going to use to film the wreck if we found it. And wouldn't you believe it, that damn thing imploded about 200 meters above crush depth. Mm. It completely just sort of folded in on itself. The electronics bottle folded up like, like, like a dead spider in the bottom of your bath. So, you know, we lost our ROV, and then eventually we got into the pack, and uh, we got into the search box. And for a while, things were really going well. Uh, the search box for that year was of my devising. It was 107 square nautical kilometers. We divide up into 11, let's say, notional lines. And the AUV would sort of go along these lines. The lines are about 1.4 kilometers apart. It'd be have an altitude of about 70 meters. And uh, every now and again, we'd meet up for what we call a handshake, you know, rendezvous, where we, uh, how would you describe it? We kind of interrogate the various payload systems. And it was really doing well. And I was really confident about, about my, my search box. And I, I, I was, uh, you know, we, we were doing so well. And the mood on the ship was great. And I was strutting the deck, puffing myself up like a- Aesop's frog, you know. I was totally insufferable. I really thought we were going to, uh, you know, we had a date with history. We were going to get that little tap on the shoulder from history. And it never came. Line seven we were on. And uh, it just disappeared. You know, what happened to it, I don't know. Uh, lots of ideas, you know, maybe went off in drift mode, in which case could be anywhere. Uh, you know, it just might have lost propulsion and just plowed into the seabed. Uh, you know, for, for two days, we were pinballing around in the pack, and all the time, it was a really bad ice year, and the ice was getting really aggressive. It was muscling up around us. It felt like we were within the coils of a boa constrictor, and the captain was getting nervous. And we spent two days, and then this monster of an ice flow came in to the search area, and there was nothing we could do. And the captain, Captain Bengu, remember him? Great guy, you know, he said, we've got to get our tails out of here. And we, we left, and I was completely demolished. I, I, I took the caning of my lifetime on that expedition. I had to crawl back to, to London. I had to go to the head office, and oh, my God. <laughs> they were in their in their boardroom, or the main guy was in the boardroom, and you know I hadn't slept the night before. You you get so tied up with nerves, and you've got expeditions which which cost millions of pounds, and uh, you know I had rats in my stomach, and I got in there, and he said to me, "Don't worry, Menson, we're not giving up." I couldn't believe it. I was in with a second chance, Tim, and then last year things were different. So, in summary, last year not now? successful, <laughs> but learned a lot. Uh, not successful. It's a things, euphemism, right? if ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we learned a lot. Yeah. You know, being serious a moment, we did learn a lot. Actually, we learned when we went in there first time. I think as part of my arrogance, I really thought that we could impose our will on the ice. Uh, in fact, there was nothing of the kind. But when we went in the second time, when you were with us, we allowed, allowed the ice to, to, as it were, impose its will on us. But also, we realized that maybe AUVs were not the best type of equipment. And then we invested in that incredible bit of kit called the Sabre Tooth, made by, mm-hmm. made by Saab of Sweden. And yeah. um, that's what cracked it in the end. We'll, we'll get into that. The marine yeah, robotics are fascinating. Um, that's, so that's the Weddell Sea expedition of 2019. In a nutshell. You got the rare opportunity, and many others from the 2019 expedition got the rare opportunity to try again with a different, uh, and there's the team for the Endurance 22. Can you tell us, basically, oh God, yeah. I mean, it, no one person accomplishes something like this alone. Oh, this is total talk teamwork, about, talk yeah. About this team uh, and this second, com- kind of summarizes it all, doesn't it? But you can see they're all kind of divvied up, aren't you, into their various areas of expertise. Oh, those are the engineers down there, that's the domestic staff, those are the back deck guys. There's the captain first officer, Nico Vincent, right in the middle in the orange. He was the star of the show. The great John Shears over there on beside Nico. Ha, there's the ice skipper. And where's Captain, ba- captain Bengo right beside Nico there? And then all the guys around the back, there was, where are you? You're, you're there, right? Yeah. That, that yeah. was what you call the media the team, media right? Media team, right? Yeah. Uh, there's the back deck guys, our guys, the Ocean Infinity guys were there, helicopter teams there. What's that, miscellaneous over there? Uh, or science. Scientists, right? Science. 
Yeah. <laughs> Remember uh, that guy, uh, John, John Albertson? Yes. He woke up on their ship that morning, and oh, he, 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 really he must have story. woken up late. And uh, he, he's walking around the ship. He hadn't heard we are going to have a photograph taken, and the ship was on automatic pilot. There's nobody in the bridge. There's nobody in the mess. There's nobody on the accommodation deck. Or, and he's walking around. Must have felt, what was that, Mary Celeste? That he ship thought he was on the, a ghost uh, ship, yeah. Yeah, you know, the yeah. ghost ship. And he's walking around, and we were all standing there, and he appears on the back helicopter deck with a cup of coffee and a look on his face. Uh, yeah. yeah, we haven't I, got time for jokes. And yet, this is this is close, yeah. but not maybe 100 percent accurate. But I think we had maybe 12 or 13 countries represented. Uh, we were on a Gee, South really? African icebreaker vessel, the SA Agulhas II, with a South African yep. crew and captain. Um, so, I think we should just relive the journey a little bit. How's that sound? Sounds good. This is us uh, leaving port in Cape Town. Hey, Tim, Tim, Kim, we're heading into port. We're heading That's into port. So we, yeah. we briefly left port and then had to go back in to like check out, right? To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do the customs. Yeah. Um, but you get the idea of pulling out of Cape Town in summer, which was quite lovely. Yeah. What was going through your mind as we were leaving Cape Town, um, uh, uh, going back down to the Weddell Sea? Yeah, a lot of apprehension at that moment. Uh, you know, I, I've been three years before. I'd been totally horsewhipped by that whole experience. And here we are heading back in. I'd been given a second chance. We had a brilliant team, new kit. Uh, and we didn't realize at that point the ice was going to be as lenient as it was. So, you know, I knew this. If, if we succeeded, my life would change. If we didn't, my life was over. You know, at my age, you don't get second chances. So, yeah, no. And I remember when we got to the Ice Edge, what was it, 10 days later or something? Yeah. You know, we're looking at the Ice Edge through binoculars, and I thought, okay, this is it. This is a pivotal moment, you know, in my life. When we come out of the pack in two weeks' time, I'm going to be totally, you know, wasted, finished, done, dried up, gone, you know. Or, you know, it's going to be a book coming out, and wonderful <laughs> things will happen. And, yeah. It went the right direction. I, I, you know, I think a few other people felt the same thing. Yes. Yeah. And as soon as we left port, we were in the South Atlantic off of really yeah. shipping channels in the roaring 40s, the furious 50s, the screaming, screaming 60s. 60s. It makes there. you want to go there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you've mm. spent a lot of time at sea on various expeditions. Does yeah, no, I, I, uh, I worked after I left school before I went to university. Uh, I, I was headed for life at sea, and that was in the South Atlantic. I, I, I signed up an old... Uh, triple steam expansion ship, probably the last of the old steamers, and we plied the South Atlantic routes, you know, from the River Plate down to the Falklands, Cape Ore to South Georgia, up to South Africa. So, yeah, this was sort of like my backyard kind of thing. But these are also the most consistently savage seas mm -hmm. on Earth. And we, we, we didn't so much take a thumping, did we, on the way down? We practiced what we call weather routing. You remember that storm systems were coming at us? Everything's from west to east down there. And sometimes we slowed ship, so we come around the back of the storm systems, and other times we speeded up and raced around the front of the storm. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. That's the old clip away we're, we're crossing there. I'm, I'm only smirking because you were having a great time. I was dreadfully seasick and trying to oh. do live stream events with kids yeah, uh, yeah. in the midst of it. But it oh, was Tim, no, wait, 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 wait. Let's pause there. You know, as long as we're <laughs> handing out the kudos here, let me just say this. I mean, you are utterly amazing. I didn't know you when we, when we got on the ship. Right? Well, we corresponded and things. But what really, really impressed me about you, and Charles and Peter, uh, Peter's here with Charles. Yeah, your dad was utterly amazing because he got seasick in the first two or three days. And seasickness, I don't get it, but it's, it's the worst thing ever. All you can feel is nausea. All you can think about is throwing up. And my definition of a professional is being able to get up in the morning when, and when you really, really don't feel like it, you get up and you do your damn best work you're capable of. And your dad was like that. He got up there feeling seasick and he did all these live casts and things. And he was white as a sheet. It was an, it was yeah. an adventure. <laughs> So yeah, this is what the back deck of the SA Gals look like in, in transit on one of the, the wavier days. And yeah. I later learned it is, it's an ice-breaking vessel, so it does not have stabilizers, the things that keep a lot of cruise ships that go uh, down to the Antarctic um, from rolling as much. Uh, so it was, I, I felt the South Atlantic. It was, but it was also yeah. beautiful, but you, whales but you know, everywhere. Yeah, but you know what I'm thinking, looking at this photograph here, 
is not this one, but you remember when we had that really bad weather when we were in the pack and the sleet was coming at us mm -hmm. like horizontally over the <laughs> back deck. And you walk out there in those days and like you're stepping into, into some like white phantasmagoria, a white yeah. oblivion on the back deck. And all those guys were bundled up. You could just see the tips of their noses. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, temperatures plummeted to almost minus 40. It was dangerous stuff. And that's the Antarctic and the Weddell Sea in summer. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was thinking if Shackleton had been there for that winter in the tents, they would not have survived. Uh, Those brutal. tents, like one little, uh, you know, narrow sheet of linen, mm -hmm. and that was it. You know, they got down to minus 50, 60 in winter. How could they have survived if they'd had this? It's remarkable. It gives it's you good remarkable. perspective to live yeah. it yourself even 100 years later. Um, this is for the map lovers. I know there are many in the Newberry uh, world, myself included. Um, great uh, science team from Drift and Noise uh, was using satellite data on a constant basis to charter or chart uh, and monitor the thickness of sea ice. And I think that this map, and Mensa, I'd love to hear, hear you speak about this, shows why endurance has long been considered the hardest shipwreck in the world to find. Why is yeah. why did nobody? Or maybe people we, consider no. finding endurance. No, before, no, no. We we used to uh, used to be she was called the unreachable endurance. You know, which kind of implies that this is, well, it was. It was the greatest, hardest wreck hunt there's ever been. Yeah, yeah. So, what, do you want me to talk? talk yeah, yeah. Go ahead. yeah. So, uh, let's see, what have we got here on this side? Oh, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, so there's our track down from Cape Town down to Weddell Sea down here. And this is what I want to draw your attention this purple area right there, that is the Weddell Sea pack. And, uh, well, they've marked the endurance spot there. And this is the thing which, uh, which got to me. When we were there in, um, in 2019, the pack was absolutely solid. You know, it was, it was like a hard carapace of ice, and it was thick. It was old, multi-year ice, gnarled, as tough as old teak, and there's no way we'd be able to bounce and slash our way through that, I mean. But do you remember how it was when we were there last year? Yeah. All that had gone. There was no cohesion. There was no uh, pressure within the pack. It had opened up. And it was wonderful for us because it meant we just went straight down. We had that, what was that little thing they called the devil's uh, finger there? Yeah, the, the we chief scientist, Lassie yeah. Robinstein, um, named that Neptune's finger because it pointed finger. right, the thin uh, ice pointed us, right yeah. to the endurance. Yeah, yeah you see the yellow there. That was the Neptune's finger, wasn't yep. it? Uh, and God, I don't think we broke at all, maybe the last nautical mile or so to get into the box. But I mean, no. that is terrible news for the planet, Tim, you know, to have lost all that ice in three years and it hasn't come back, you know, it's... This is what it looked like when you get to the yeah. edge of the Weddell Sea ice. Actually, you get a better sense of it in this. Is this taken from the No, it's taken from the bridge, isn't it? But you know, there, there is no no pressure here. There's no right. consolidation at all. And then we get to this. Yeah, and this is in the search box, isn't it? And, and during the first year, it was so bad that yeah, we actually got caught in the ice not once but three times, and it was a bit scary one time. And, uh, you know, and we found out that if you get stuck in the ice, there's nothing you could do. We had this 16-ton canister or tank. Yeah, of eight, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Right, where is it? yeah, right there, this thing here. And we had 16 tons, this helicopter field. We'd swing it from one side of the ship to the other. Just, you know, so the, you know, you didn't actually become cemented into the ice because you're in the iron grip of the ice. Oh, my God, it's scary stuff. Because then all you got to hope for is that as the tide rises and sort of puts impl imposes pressure on the underside of the ice, that that will open up cracks. And that's what happened in 2019 when we got really stuck. Cracks suddenly appeared on the high tide. We gunned the ship, made for the cracks, and we got out. But otherwise, you know, there was certainly a feeling on board that we could have ended up on the wrong side of history, like the endurance, you know? An amazing feeling yeah. to come back with 100 years of ship technology and great everything and know that the ice is still in charge in the Weddell Sea. Yeah, but no longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, what are we looking at here? This is a, another map. Um, yeah. Oh, this is the, uh, the ice boy, isn't it? Yeah. We, we, we try to understand. I, I mentioned before how we, we changed our sort of our modus operandi or our philosophy towards the ice. So this time around, the idea was using satellite intelligence. Um, to work with the ice, allow it to, to, as I said before, impose its its will on us, by which I mean we would look for a flow which was of suitable 
thickness, heading in the right direction at the right speed. And then this was actually the ice skipper's idea. It wasn't any of ours, but he devised this way of working with the ice whereby we would um, position, we'd find a suitable flow and then drive the ship into the flow about, uh, what, about four or five ship's lengths, wasn't it? And then we'd let the ship kind of fall back on itself to wash away all the broken ice which, acc which, which accumulates in the bottom of the ship so it doesn't come up in the moon pool when we open the moon pool doors. And then what he'd do, he would, he would position the ship about you know, two or three cables distance up drift of where we wanted to deploy. And then as we came down over the spot, we would deploy. And you remember what he did? We, we, he, he created that kind of pool of about 50 meters diameter at the stern of the ship because what he did was he'd apply, wasn't very much, about 800 kilowatts of power to both shafts, which created just enough prop wash at the back of the ship to, 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 to push away any rogue ice in that pond that pool at the back. And it was brilliant, wasn't it? Because never once did we have any rogue ice in there. And it was great because all the emperor penguins had come along and the minky whales would minky come whales up. whales could surface, yeah. yeah. Was in many, for many days, it was the only open ice you could see. So if you stood on the back deck and watched the water, yeah. within 30 minutes, a whale would surface. Did you ever get the whale sort of come right up on the stir? It happened to me once, and you got like the whiff of its air, and you go, oh, God, those things stuck. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember the penguins swimming in that, that backwash. Yeah. They loved that. It was and like that a leopard seal coaster. that appeared that day. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a peaceable kingdom, wasn't it, on the ice, yeah. So this is the search box, which uh, you devise 15 kilometers by eight kilometers. Oh, right? actually, this is the one we used last year. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, the, the, the original search box, this is much bigger uh, and broader, and we narrowed the longitude on it, or rather dosed it. Uh, yeah, again, you see, if you look at this photograph here, all this black here, that's, that's pretty much open water. Space. You know, all, all that, that, that crust of, of ice, which is the pack is gone yeah and you really get a sense of it in this picture so uh yeah i don't know what else we can say about that well, but the one you should have had was actually the the track ship the, the track of the the ship in there because it looked like a you know in 2019 we worked in a very linear fashion and this year we were all over the show you remember yeah so the, you know it was like spaghetti junction in there if you look <laughs> where we sailed yeah it's, yeah this is a beautiful map i think uh I want to jump to sort of the stars of, yeah. of the search. And, you know, we've got two, two things going on in this photo. We have the world's most experienced underwater search team and some technology that makes, unlocks places yeah. like the bottom of the Weddell Sea. Can you talk a little bit about both? Uh, yeah, we had this incredible team which came under, uh, I mentioned his name before, Nico Vincent mm -hmm. or Vincent. Uh, uh, and Nico put together this amazing team in France during the pandemic. Uh, they, they bubbled up together there and they did all, they brought together all the kit and they went up to Sweden where this one here was made especially for Ocean Infinity. They learned how to operate it. Uh, incredible bunch of guys. And this bit of kit here, uh, it's not an AUV, it's, it's, it's a saber tooth it's called. Uh, they call it an AUV, AUV ROV hybrid, but really what interested us was this cord here, right? You remember, Tim? Mm -hmm. This is the difference. That red cord that comes down there like that, that is the, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's a tethered system we were employing this time. So at times we had eight kilometers of that red cable off the back of the ship. The beauty of it was that if we lost the vehicle, as we did in 2019, we would always know exactly where it was three-dimensionally beneath the ship, and we could send the second vehicle down to rescue the first. But more importantly was the fact that we were getting our data in real time because of that tethered system. In 2019, you programmed the AUV to go where you wanted it to go. It would toddle off. You wouldn't see it for a day or two. It would come back. You'd download the data uh, to the server, which would uh, convert it into, into, into a format which was intelligible to data analysts. And then you'd identify your anomalies. And then you'd send down the ROV to check it. You know, it went on and on and on. 
Uh, but with this system, if we saw something on the seabed, uh, what we call the point of interest, you remember what we do, we'd simply switch this vehicle out of search and survey mode, mode into inspection mode, and then we would just toddle off uh, and, and check out whatever it was. And if it was drop stones from an iceberg, we knew immediately it was drop stones, or if it was a dead whale or something, we knew it was a dead whale, or if it was the endurance, we knew it was the endurance, but straight away like that. Well, it's, you know, there's not much at the bottom of the Weddell Sea. So when you see something, yeah. it's usually something. Yeah. Um, well, that's what happened on the 5th of March last year. <laughs> I, I mean, sonar uh, returns are quite abstract, especially if you're operating at low frequency. But, you know, when that, that on the 5th of March, when that sonar uh, return came in, they knew that it was man-made straight away. And the only Got on, they got France, Francois in, remember? Yeah. Uh, Francois is, again, one of the French team. And he'd spent, he spent his whole career uh, chasing, chasing Russian submarines. <laughs> and so he's, he's one of the top four uh, sonar specialists in the world. And he came into the control room at the back of the ship. He took one look and he said, Settel, it's her. And then, yeah, remember they couldn't say anything because John and I were out on the ice there. You're jumping uh, ahead. You're jumping ahead. Oh, okay. Don't yeah, I don't, know, I don't know the order of your slides. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's, it's, um, I, that's I understand the there. impulse. Yeah. Um, let me go to the next slide because even though we were at the tail end of summer in the Weddell Sea, it did get dark for some hours of the day. Yeah. Um, and this was a 24-hour, round-the-clock operation. Yeah. We were uh, searching for several weeks. But we got to a point where we were down to the final five, six days before we absolutely had to go back. Actually, it was less than that. But yeah, yeah, it was Your it was point close. is good. I mean, <laughs> we, our backs were up against the wall. That's yeah. Good. Tell me. I mean, the captain said to me, because you remember we had that horrendous period of, what was it, about four or five really bad days. I mean, it was serious stuff. I was joking before about the sleet coming horizontally. Yeah. No, it was coming horizontally across the deck there. And uh, it was just continuous blizzard. And the, and the skipper said to me, the captain said to me, you know, neither man nor ship can take much more of this. Uh, and he gave us a day, a day and a half. And then the meteorologist came in and said, look, we're going to have two beautiful days. <laughs> and uh, wouldn't you know it, the 5th of March last year, I opened my curtains and it was just glorious. The blizzards had gone, temperatures were up. And uh, you remember, it had really been brutal stuff. We had a team there just servicing the team on the back deck. We had that guy whose eyelids got frozen closed. Yeah. I popped a couple of my fillings. The, yeah. the bosun said to me, at these kind of temperatures, you freeze mercury. And then we got those two beautiful days. And then John and I went out on the ice. Is this the right moment to talk this about This is that? the right moment, yes. Okay, We're right. talking talk about so, the yeah. iceberg. So, uh, yeah, wouldn't you know it, you know? It had to be. We were out on the ice when the, when the wreck was found. It, we'd been talking for some days about um, if we had the opportunity of getting out on the ice just to stretch our legs, nothing more. Uh, it didn't look like it was going to happen. But that day, it was great. I opened the curtains. We were locked in this great schism of ice and about about two, it's very difficult to judge distances in the ice, do you remember? But it was about two kilometers away it was that massive iceberg locked into, into the flow with us. And so John and I decided to go for it. And it was about, uh, three o'clock, about mid afternoon. I, I didn't didn't record the time, and we we layered up and we set off for the iceberg. And it must have been about half an hour after we we left the ship that that incredible sonar image appeared. And and if you remember, I'd switched. <laughs> I don't remember this day why I did it, but I switched channels on my handheld, and I told the bridge that I did that, but I forgot to tell the guys in the back deck. So they were trying to contact us on the ice and couldn't get through. And then we got back on board, I don't know, about half an hour or so after they found it. And we had no idea what had happened. And I was frozen to the bone. And I'm there, and I'm getting, I'm de-kidding. And all I can think about is getting some coffee in me. And then one of the, uh, one of the cadets in the bridge, I didn't see him coming. He was just suddenly standing beside me. And his words to me were, uh, Captain Bengo asked me to convey his respects and to say that your presence is required on the bridge immediately. <laughs> and I'm like remonstrating with him, you know, come on, just give me, you know, I've got to get some 
hot fluids. And, oh, come up in 15 things, no mints. <laughs> and then the tannoy system crackled to life and it was bound and she is, she is and bound to the bridge immediately. Uh, and John and I looked at each other and we both had very vivid, painful memories of what had happened three years before when we lost the AUV, the search vehicle. So he and I both thought, oh God, no, please not again. And then we had this, the thought that maybe because terrible things happen at sea, maybe there's been a really bad accident on board. So we're racing up to the bridge and um, uh, on the way up, I spot one of the, uh, uh, one of the French data analysts standing in a doorway He's smiling, yeah, you know, like from ear to ear, like the front end of an old Hudson, as we used to say when I was a kid here in the States. And, and um, I just knew at that moment that, you know, if we lost our vehicle, you know, 10 million pounds worth of kit, you're not smiling, you're, you're, your face is drained. So we're getting up the stairs and I'm beginning to think, oh, yeah, please pray God, you know, let this be it. And we, we tumble out onto the bridge and Captain Bengu was standing at the, at the central console of the bridge, and he was smiling. And Nico was standing right beside him. And he, he came over to us, and he grabbed his iPhone like this, and he thrust it in my face. <laughs> yeah, and he said, gents, let me introduce you to the endurance. And, uh, yeah, it was... Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Never had a thought of... the moment. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's what uh, Variety magazine used to call polite plaudits. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, it's, guys. It's, no, it's, it's an exciting moment. I it mean, was for us. It was an emotional yeah. roller coaster. Yeah, were well, you on the it bridge? That, the, you, you, you weren't on the bridge. You, I, um, I found you, out at dinner. It was the worst kept secret by dinner time. Uh, that, I do remember that moment. It was after we were celebrating on the bridge, and suddenly this sound came up from somewhere in the nether regions of the ship, and it just rose up, not so much like a, an orchestral crescendo. No, not like that. It was like a series of whoops. And it was coming up from the accommodation areas down below, you know, the engine room somewhere. That must have been you. You've been one of those guys at that moment. <laughs> yeah. But the, the moment of discovery, uh, that was incredible on the, on the bridge because, you know, I, 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 I have f fractured memories of actually that, that particular second, what happened after Nico said that to us. Uh, but there was this 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 um, uh, sunburst of just pure undiluted euphoria, and people were jumping up and down and slapping each other on the back. And yeah, there were a few uh, few um, what you might call unmanly moments with some, not me, not me, of course, but with some. There were there were there were tears in their eyes. Yeah, and uh, I remember Chad. Yeah. yeah, chat. You remember we had rules, there were protocols in place for what happened if we discovered the endurance. And the first thing was to close down the ship real quick because if we didn't do that, everybody pinging off messages. And um, there was Chad over, over there. And I knew what he was doing. He's being all furtive with his phone. He's like doing this in the corner. I go over to him. He, he's an old friend, Chad is. I go, hey, Bonnie, what the hell do you think you're doing? You know, you know this is against the rules, sending messages to your wife. He turned to me and he goes, Menson. We've just found the endurance. We are the lords of the deep. We make the friggin' rules. <laughs> <laughs> oh. you, I think that may have been the moment he was sending me the picture. Like that's oh, how yeah. I found out. He was probably <laughs> I assumed me. it was his wife. Um, yeah. But we've got three pictures here okay, let's of, go for it. of endurance. Oh, this Beautiful is, uh, 4K yeah. pictures. And mm. I want, I have no questions. I just want you to talk about what you see because this is your forte. Oh, this is the best. This is the you, you never get a oh. chance to see a ship. Of and this is, this is my first view. You know, we only made, we, because of the, the weather situation, because after those two days, remember, it just came back and just slammed us, absolutely whacked the daylights out of us. And we had only time for two dives. Mm -hmm. One dive was to secure the data, and the other dive was, <laughs> you know, 2019 was the worst moment of life, my, my, my entire life. The best, the pinnacle, was the archaeological dive. Uh, when we went down with the cameras, not in the not in the, in the, in the saber tooth guys. Uh, uh, and we saw, I saw the, the endurance. There were only four of us in the control booth. There, there was the guy at the sticks, there was a hydrographer, and there was a data analyst. Actually, five. There was, there was a cameraman, one of your colleagues mm -hmm. there in the corner filming it all. And we approached the wreck on the heading on which the wreck is sitting on the seabed. So he came at it from the, from the stern. And the first thing I saw 
was the rudder, which is right here. Right here. And we're just like, you know, that far above the seabed and we run into this. And I couldn't believe it because the rudder was not supposed to be there. Because in the diaries in Shackleton's book, they're absolutely clear. The ice ripped off the rudder, tore it off, and they said the rudder had gone. And yet there it was, right under the tuck of the stern. So it must still be attached to the ship by a by a strop or something between the pinnacle, you know, between the, the pinnacle uh, pintles and the gudgeons. It must be something there connecting them. Uh, and, and I'm looking at this and thinking, can't be. And then we elevated the cameras. And then, then we're looking at the stern of the endurance, and all the lights are on it. In fact, it's the moment when this photograph was taken. And there, you know, the nine letters of endurance arcing across the stern above the five pointed star, the North Star, the Polaris, after the Norwegians named the ship. Norwegians built this ship, remember. And I'm looking at it, and, and you've got to remember, I've spent my entire career, 32 consecutive years, that means every year, year after year, surveying, examining, excavating, evaluating shipwrecks, but never, ever, not once, have I ever seen a wreck as bold and beautiful as this. I mean, and this paintwork was, you know, you can, you can see the paintwork right here. I mean, it's incredible that it survived. And, and that, those little white lines, that's, that's the corking between uh, the seams where the planks of the wood sort of uh, uh, abut each other edge to edge. Uh, I mean, it was just unbelievable. And where the paint had been rubbed off, like you can see up there, we could see the grain of the wood. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, please, God, do have the next slide where we yeah, go up and over sure. the taffrail. No, um, oh, Tim, yeah, because then sorry. we're up and over the taffrail. I have to talk them through the next You've got to say something for the film. This is, uh, this is the best we oh, can do. Oh, no, I'm glad to talk about the next <laughs> bit. No, don't worry. The, I, what, what Tim is talking about is we, we can't show you some slides. And we get this, don't we? You know, because Nat Geo and Disney, they're doing, they're working on it right now as we speak, this amazing film uh, about this discovery. And so, of course, you know, they're pouring resource into this film. So you don't want us giving the, the game away. But I'm allowed to talk about a few things. But oh, I don't know this time next year or something, you will hear about it, I promise you, because Disney and Nat Geo, they're going to go huge on this, and it's brilliant. And they have two utterly amazing directors, Oscar-winning directors they brought in to do this, right? Uh, Jimmy Chin and, and Chai Vassarelli, you know, top flight guys. This is going to be great. So next, next year. Uh, so yeah, before we got the bow, so we came up and over the taffrail at the stern of the ship, and we're looking at the ship's wheel. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, we used to joke on the way down, this one, this yeah. is the one. So how do we get? You know, we're at the stern, then you go down to, come on, Tim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is the picture I was hoping for. So like we come up over the taffrail, and I just could not believe we were looking at the ship's wheel. I mean, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. And we used to joke about it, you know, on the trip down, you know, what happens if we found the ship and the ship's wheel there and the skipper's still lashed to the helm and stuff. You know, <laughs> crazy stuff. We never for one second thought we'd actually find the ship's wheel. And there it was. You could even see the King spoke. It was that clear. And there you got the, the steering mechanism. You got a few uh, fathoms of uh, studling chain there. And this diagonal thing, that's the ship's tiller. That's what turned the rudder. And then uh, just behind, you can see through the spokes, the wheel there. That's the ship's compass, a binnacle. And behind that, that's the companionway, which takes you down to the accommodation deck. And you can see the doors open or it's off its hinges there. And those little pigeonholes, well, those pigeonholes are where they kept the signal flags, which had run up the gaff. And then this, this you know, talking about the pinnacle of my life, that the absolute pinnacle of my life is what came next. Shackleton's cabin. We're looking at the portholes to Shackleton's cabin, right there on the right. That's where the great man spent his time. And I'm looking at these two portholes, and I know that between those two portholes, on the other side of the wall, of course, there is a fixed, a picture frame, a fixed top and bottom with a single screw. And that within this picture frame, there is a copy of Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. And I knew that it was still there and it was still legible. You know, it's just archaeology just, you know, God must love archaeologists, you know, to give us moments like that. <laughs> and then, uh, what, oh, then we went down the poop deck and uh, towards the bow. And uh, how are we doing for time, Tim? We're doing great. Can you talk about 
I mean, first of all, we could not remove anything from the wreck. We didn't oh, touch yeah, the wreck. Yeah. We did, right, Tim's right. This is an important point. This was not a, a, a smash and grab, help, you, help yourself job, no. <laughs> this, this was archeology. span We did it by the book. We did not touch anything. It was non-disturbance. We looked, we recorded, we left. Uh, so yeah, thank yeah. you for reminding and me. And more than that, use some pretty high tech stuff to survey this wreck in a way yeah. that is not. That's right. Yeah, we use the laser scan technology, which <laughs> a year and a half ago was. Now I see it's being used all over the world already. But at that moment, it, it was you know the best, wasn't it? There wasn't anything better to to to. We recorded her in tiny detail, and you will see this on the Nat Geo Disney film. And some of the things we saw were just mind blowing. Uh, should we talk about some of those things we saw? Because I'm allowed to talk about the, the crockery, which is laying about on the deck. And we saw a telescope. We saw a sewing machine. Uh, and oh, and then Pierre, as he was processing the laser scans, he came to my cabin one day and he said, I think I found a gun. And I'm going, no, 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 Pierre, you have not found a handgun. You know, because, you know, they took the guns with them. You know, they took the handguns, the pistol, they took the rifle and the shotguns when they left the ship. And he goes, no, no, Minson, I think that's... So I went with him. And we went back and we looked at it together, and he was right. It was a handgun, except it wasn't a pistol. It was one of the ship's flare guns he'd found. And straight away, because I'd, I'd studied all the, di the diaries in great detail, I knew what this was about. Because when Shackleton left the ship for the last time, uh, before he left, he was with two others. Uh, Hurley was one that would have been wild or maybe Worsley, three of them. Anyway, they took the flare gun, they put a detonator cap in it, and they fired it in salute to the flag. And then they threw it on the deck, and they left. And that flare gun, you know, that ship had fallen through 3,000 meters, and you know, still it's there. still there. Yeah, still I mean, there I, I can't explain yeah. it. And then there was that boot laying on the deck, remember? Yeah. Uh, there was a, a seaman's boot just laying on the deck. And we record, or, or I knew it because... We have these wonderful photographs by a man called Frank Hurley. And in one of the photographs is a picture of a guy called uh, Frank Wilde, who is Shackleton's deputy. And he's wearing his sea boots. And they have these very, very distinctive buckles just beneath the knee, right? Mm -hmm. And all the other sea boots were a regulation issue, were very different. But, you know, I knew straight away that this had to be Wilde's boot. And, you know, it's just laying there. It's bizarre. It can't be very often that you can draw such a direct connection between an artifact oh. and photos that are 100 years apart. Yeah. It, no, you, it's you're right. It's kind too. of uh, surreal. I, I, I'm a very lucky guy. You know, a lifetime of archaeology. I have had some wonderful moments underwater, but nothing compares with this. I mean, I've, I've excavated ships of all kinds, all periods, all over the world. There are over 12 museums of permanent collections of stuff which I've excavated, but nothing, nothing compares yeah. with this. All right. Well, we had the joy together of sharing the news of the discovery of the wreck with 33,000 kids who are following live uh, through the virtual exchange program that I was hosting. And I think in this scene, you are describing the wreck site as a bar scene in Star Wars where <laughs> there's no other carbon on this, the bottom of the Weddell Sea. So all the creatures over the course of 100 years have gravitated towards I thought it was a great oh, analogy. Yeah, I was the joking. kids loved it. Yeah. It was like very easy to imagine and even yeah. like go beyond perhaps. But the, the living I things forgot on that. The yeah, I did, didn't I? Just Star like Wars. The bar scene yeah, that, Star was, Wars. that was that was poetic, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it was really good. good. Yeah, you know, you know all the Star Wars movie. There's always that intergalactic bar moment where all the riffraff from across the universe gathers in this bar. It's always there. Every movie, yeah. it's there. Yeah. Uh, and I was I was comparing it to to life on, on the wreck, where it's saying just everything that can creep or crawl or burrow or swim, you know, it's just heading, you know, towards the, towards the endurance, you know, and it, the, the endurance is this, 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 this oasis of, 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 of Attenborough-esque uh, life-enjoying festival of whatever, you know, it's just unbelievable. And yeah, we, we saw some of that, didn't we? When yeah. those pictures we saw a few moments ago, you know, we saw the hydroids, we saw the ascidians. And what, well, actually what interests me here is, is some of the stuff you cannot see because shipwrecks are, are just, you know, these, these wonderful, you know, they're, they're full of little chinks and crannies all 
perfect for the comfort and the accommodation of little wriggly minor life forms. You know, we can't see them here, but they are there. You know? yeah. So, you know, that's another dimension to the study of shipwrecks. Yeah. Uh, very good. Um, oh, yeah. We had to finish up the story. We had to bring this, the story full circle. And we had a pretty, uh, pretty remarkable moment on, on the way back to Cape Town after thoroughly surveying the wreck. Yeah. Tell us about where this picture was taken and... Well, yeah, I mean, this is the Sailors Cemetery at Great Viking, one of the whaling stations on South Georgia. You see, after we found the wreck, you know, we, we had to go to South Georgia to pay our respects to the great man. Shackleton died at South Georgia and he was buried there. And that's Shackleton's grave right there. It's the only one which is pointing south. And right there, that little square, that's where the ashes of Frank Wilde are located. And um, we had a little ceremony at Graveside, didn't we, over which I officiated. And um, you remember we were all gathered around. You don't have that photograph, do you? I don't. No, okay. So we had, we had Captain Bengo uh, on the side nearest you of the grave, and I was standing on the other. Then there was John, then there was Nico. And I began by inviting Captain Bengo to say a few words. And he and I had sat in his cabin as we did, and I, I, you know, he agreed to do it. But I had no idea what he was going to say at all. I mean, he's quite a quiet guy, isn't he? And so I didn't probe too much. I was just grateful he had agreed to say a few words. So I invited him to talk first. And Captain Bengo, he, um, he started, and this is the bit that really got to me, he started to, to, to talk to Shackleton as one ship's skipper to another, didn't he? And he began with the words, Voss, I've come to tell you that we've found your baby. And then you remember he got down on his knees and he produced that laminated picture of the stern of the ship that we looked at a few moments ago, and he just laid it out on the grave. And I looked up at that point, and there wasn't Beautiful. a dry eye there at that moment. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then I invited John to say a few words. And you remember he spoke very eloquently about how when Shackleton was down there, World War I was raging, and how when we were down there, uh, Russia invaded the, Ukra the Ukraine. And you remember how that came down on the ship like a wet blanket. I mean, I've never seen the mood change on a ship like that before. And he spoke about that. And then what happened next? Oh, the great Dan Snow. I asked him to, it, yeah, that was, a, that was a brilliant, I was really clever there. I asked Dan if, he, if he'd read Shackleton's favorite poem, poem Prosperous, uh, and, and he did. And Prosperous is actually quite a hard poem, isn't it? Yeah. And he whacked every single word. He nailed it. And that poem at that moment spoke to me in ways it never had done before. And Dan, with that really deep resonating voice of his, was just perfect. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then I spoke a few moments, for a few moments about what Shackleton meant to me. And I ended up with... It was a little thought that actually sort of kissed me that afternoon as I was walking around the railing station trying to think of something to say. And it was this, that of all the expeditions which Shackleton himself led into danger, in the end, the only life that he lost was his own. Okay, let's do the little... We have, we have yeah. one final one moment of serendipity about when Shackleton uh, was actually buried. Uh, oh, yeah, and then right. that's what I said. Let's, let's go to QA. I'm yeah, right. shocked that we, we finished um, with time listen, for QA. I finished my it's water. Can I have yours? Yeah, of course. You got no, <laughs> no rare diseases or anything. <laughs> it's like talking for such a distinguished audience, kind of dries up the yeah, old yeah, um, octaves or whatever it is. You know? <laughs> if I swell up and die in the next three or four hours, it's <laughs> something you've given me. Um, yeah, so, okay, so here's the thing uh, Shackleton died on the 5th of March, uh, 1922. We found the wreck on the 5th of March, 2022. 100 years to the day, or wait, it gets better. It was um, <laughs> two days afterwards that my dear friend, Fred Bassi Mayus, tapping on my door. And you know Fred, I mean, he's, he's this sort of, he's got this kind of hippie, um, what would you call abstract, poetic, psychic streak to him, right? Yeah, he, he looks at things different to the rest of us. And he said to me, he said, Medicine, do you know what time Shackleton, Shackleton was buried? 
Uh, and you know, I had no idea, and I didn't have any research materials with me. Uh, so I called a very dear friend of mine in England, a guy called Steve Scott Fawcett. Steve Scott Fawcett, by the way, he runs the Shackleton Appreciation Society page. And if there are any sort of, you know, copper bottom card carrying Shackleton fanatics in this room, join his Shackleton Appreciation page. Amazing stuff comes out on. Uh, and so I, you know, I said, hey, Steve, come on, help me out here, will you? Look, can you tell me, you know, what time Shackleton was buried? And he couldn't. But within an hour, he was back on WhatsApp with me, and he read me this piece that had been written by one of the pallbearers at Shackleton's uh, funeral. And it was very clear. It said that the, the, the funeral began at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And Steve said, to, he rationalized it like this. He said, funerals never start on time. They're always five minutes, ten minutes late, right? And then he said, and Steve was somebody who spent several years in seminary school, so he understands this kind of stuff. He said to me that, that funerals back then were, were never as long as funerals are today. You know, 30 minutes, 35 minutes tops, that's it. And then he said they would have had to, you remember the chapels at the back of the Great Vicar Settlement, so they would have then had to process uh, from the chapel to the front of the whaling station, and then they would have passed in front of the great uh, flensing deck where they sliced up the leviathans, and then they would have processed along the front and then up the grassy knoll uh, to the cemetery right here. And then he said there would have been a prayer or two at graveside and then they would have interred Shackleton. And then he said to me, and you've got to remember that, that Steve did not know at what time we found the wreck. He said to me, they would have buried Shackleton at five minutes past four, 10 minutes past four at the latest. We found the wreck at five minutes past four. And you know, yeah, oh my God, right. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm an archaeologist. I'm a very grounded guy, ma'am, you know. But, you know, that, that, that one caught me with my agnostics down at that moment, I tell you. Yeah, so, um, you know, what, you know, usually yeah. if I'm talking about Shackleton, I just sort of, All right. you know, invite people to make Amazing. of it what they will. Yeah, there's, uh, what, what, what was the great Amazing. thing? No, yeah. I, I think that's a great place to stop. It's end. a great wow moment. We even have a couple minutes to sneak in a few questions. One or two, we'll make it fast. Um, all right. Uh, this is a good one for you, Menson. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> Why do you think so long after he lived and died, Shackleton still captures our imagination and this story can, just yeah. continues to grow? He's become a cult figure, hasn't he? Yeah, it's a, that, that's, a bit, that's always a bit dangerous for people like me who study Shackleton. Because you're dealing with cult figures, people get really upset. And uh, sort of rationale, rationality sort of goes out the window when you're dealing with cult figures. But uh, yeah, so why is it? Well, he's actually a very, he's a very difficult guy to really get a grip on at all because he, he didn't reveal anything of himself. He was editing his life as he went along in the way celebrities do. He just revealed that little bit of himself that he wanted to reveal. Uh, he wanted to be seen as a Victorian a Victorian, an Edwardian hero, and his path to that was through polar conquest. Uh, he was very, very much self-aware of what he was doing. He, he was he was chasing fame, and uh, what can I say? That's pretty much what drove him. But we don't really know really what made him tick beyond that. He's a, he's a a very complicated guy in the sense that he's this bag of contradictions. On the one hand, he was a very organized doer, and yet on the other hand, he was this fleecy-headed idealist who dreamed, literally dreamed of buried treasure, and, uh, uh, and he, you know, he learned poetry by the yard, and you know, he dreamed of pearl fisheries in, in lagoons in the South Pacific and stuff like that. And yet he was incredibly brave. He was courageous. He was determined. He was a great leader of men. Uh, you can't take that away from him. Uh, but on the other side, he was this fame-hungry self-seeker who relentlessly uh, pursued his own trajectory, if you like. He was a man who was very kind, very generous. He was uh, you know, the heart of affability. He would do anything for a friend. And yet, at the same time, he could be incredibly 
combative, incredibly, sometimes a little nasty, and things like that. Uh, he was always suspicious. He never forgot or forgave an injury. Uh, he was somebody who was very, very cautious. You know, they called him Cautious Jack. Uh, everything he did was very calculated and, and thought through. But at the same time, he was incredibly impetuous and unrudded and torrential. Uh, you know, all these, you know, he, his wasn't a, a, a really unified character at all. Uh, people see it and compare him to the great Elizabethan adventurers. And I get that, I really do. You know, Drake, Hawkins, Cavendish, Davis, oh, and Sir Walter Raleigh, of mm. course. I mean, Sir Walter Raleigh, that's Shackleton. You know, they both dreamed of gold and riches. They're adventurers, they were seamen, they were poets, they loved the written world. Word. They cultivated royalty, both of them, for which they received knighthoods. But I, I tend to see him more as maybe because of my classical archaeological upbringing. I, I, I think of him more as sort of the, in terms of the, the, the mythological figures. You know, if you think of Theseus escaping the labyrinth, that's Shackleton. Think of Jason pursuing the Golden Fleece. Who else, right? Think of the labors of Hercules. It's pure Shackleton. Think of valiant Achilles, wily Odysseus, battling Ajax. You know, like Sisyphus, he cheated death. Like Orpheus, he could, he could, he could charm the very rocks and rivers. You know, he, he really is this really strange, complex, amazing guy. And that's what people latch onto. And that's why they'll still be talking you know, about Shackleton 100 years from now. All right. But Sorry, I get a bit messianic. About <laughs> you Shackleton. heard it there from the person who uh, <laughs> knows him better than most. Yeah. Nice. Vince, we turn it back over to you. Thanks. Oh, go and sign some books. Yeah. yeah. Guys, before, I, uh, the book I should have explained, I've got the stamp endurance found with me today. You got it, right, Joe? Yeah, okay, so every book we sell, we stamp, Endurance Found. And this stamp we had with us in Antarctica. And you remember there are people on board this ship who didn't like me having this stamp before we actually found the, the, the wreck. They said it was, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was tempting fate. And yet, the moment we found the wreck, they were the very ones who were, yeah, 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 please stamp my yeah. passport. Yeah. And remember, there was a, you know, I had to stamp her forehead. So she, oh, it was, it was crazy. So yeah, right. it's... Great. Thank you. Thank you all.